now um, I'd like to go into our keynote speaker. Um, and as our district attorney, Summer Seppin mentioned um, during her welcoming remarks, Dr. Gary Vilk um, is a true partner to not only us here at the Mess Strike Force, but to San Diego County as a whole. Um, he is nationally known for his work in excited delirium syndrome, and we are lucky enough to have him here in San Diego County. So Dr. Velk, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you all this morning, even being virtually, I think it's, a, it's important to get this type of information out and share it. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to be able to speak with such an esteemed group that's doing such, such great work for our community. Uh, excited delirium syndrome is a very sensitive topic. It's, uh, it's divisive, it's sensitive, it's, um, it, it's got a lot of issues with it right now. And my goal really isn't to get hung up specifically on, on excited delirium syndrome as, as the words, but really the syndrome that presents with it. Uh, this is a medical condition. It's a medical emergency and it impacts many people, obviously the individual uh, involved as well as their family, but also the people trying to take care of them, uh, healthcare workers, EMS workers, law enforcement, uh, it impacts everybody, especially when uh, an end result sometimes is a death. And so it, it's a broad reaching topic that I think is important for us to work on. Um, uh, there is a chat box here. I don't get to see it while I'm lecturing, but if there are questions that come up or at, at, during the talk or at the end of the talk, we'll certainly make sure we try to address them. Um, but if I'm not answering your chats as we go, please don't be bothered by that. Oops. So just as a quick background, who am I? Why am I speaking with you this morning? Um, my primary role is I'm an emergency physician. I work at UCSD. I've been there almost 30 years now. I did my medical school training here in San Diego. I did my residency in emergency medicine, and I've worked uh, both the Hillcrest and the La Jolla facilities now for, for that time period. Um, since the mid nineties, I've done research in arrest related deaths, uh, positions, restraints, pepper spray, excited delirium tasers. Uh, and mainly it's looking at the physiologic effects. How do these things affect individuals from a physiologic perspective, their breathing, their heart rate, and things like that. So it's really trying to get data out there that shows what, what happens to individuals during certain things. When we restrain them in the emergency department because we have to get control to be able to treat them, how does that impact their physiology? I was the county EMS medical director, and I currently serve for 17 medical services in North County as their medical director. So I work with the EMS system on a regular basis. Uh, I worked at our jail system uh, on site for 16 years and helped medical direct for UCSD's relationship with them. So I have experience at that level, as well as having uh, experience with tactical and weapons of mass destruction. Uh, I was the medical director for the Metropolitan Medical Strike Team for San Diego County for many years. So again, uh, I, I have sort of like the emergency medicine role, jack of all trades, but a lot of experience in the population of, of individual that we'll be seeing. And finally, I, I do a lot of uh, research and, and, uh, and, that, and academics. Um, I've written about 90 textbook chapters, about a quarter of them on arrest-related deaths and policing issues, restraints, uh, excited delirium. Uh, I've got about 300 peer-reviewed publications in medical journals. Uh, again, a lot of them on these issues of excited delirium and uh, drug use and agitation. I've been funded. I've written a couple textbooks. So that's my background. That's why I guess I get the opportunity to, to, in, to speak with you all today. By way of disclosures, I have never received corporate funding from any of the companies that might be discussed and things that have not been paid by Taser or anything like that. I have received funding from the National Institute of Health, uh, the National Institute of Justice, and the Institute for the Prevention of In-Custody Deaths for some of the research that I did perform. I am a paid legal consultant. Just for an overview of things, uh, excited delirium is often uh, associated with arrest-related death in the public, in the media, and things like that. And so just for overview, there's some been work done looking at police encounters. Um, you know, and when you look at things like uh, Hall's work or Baldwin's work, you know, the, the rate of police encounters with regards to a use of force event 
you know, so 3.25 million encounters, 5.4 million encounters, 10.9 million encounters, you know, the rates of use of force in those are fairly low. Uh, the arrest related deaths of that population is even lower. And so if you look at it, the risk of an arrest related death associated with a police encounter really is 0.00004%. Um, but when it does happen, it's, it's, it's a bad event for everybody. It really is. And so that's where this, but I just want everybody to understand this is the tip of the iceberg we're looking at. Uh, when you sort of put it in the numbers again, you know, three to four deaths per 10 million interactions uh, or four deaths per 10,000 use of force events. So every time an officer has to go hands-on with somebody or use a taser or pepper spray, um, there are risks, but the risks end up truly, when you look at the full count, as fairly low. We want to make that lower. So excited delirium. Uh, delirium itself is an acute disturbance uh, in consciousness, orientation, or cognition. Um, excited delirium, I sort of describe it as it's delirium on steroids. Uh, there's more violence, there's more combative behavior, there's more agitation, uh, there's other stuff going on. There's sweatiness, there's a revving up, and we'll talk more about this as we go along. But the idea is that this is a, its, its own level of, of agitation that goes up. There is history. Um, there is historical features of excited delirium syndrome that start back even in the 1840s. This is uh, published uh, back in the American Journal of Insanity, back before I think we're more politically sensitive, in 1849 uh, by Luther Bell. He uh, recognized that there were deaths amongst the mentally ill. Uh, people were not using methamphetamine back then or cocaine. They just, the drugs weren't there. Uh, but there certainly was disorders such as schizophrenia and mania that required treatment. And they tried to treat them with the best uh, modalities they had. Um, and if you read his paper here, you know, the temperature uh, is, is elevated 102, uh, pulse of 120, whole body covered with perspiration, very restless, continuing to jump out of bed much under the delusion that he and his friends are in trouble. Apparently much frightened about fire, restraint was necessary. They tried with uh, ice, milk and wine and tried to manage these people. Um, you know, the temperature of 102 and a half, that's not just purely from schizophrenia. That's not paranoia. That is some level of dysfunction that's much, much higher. And what he described was that there was an onset of fatigue, cardiovascular collapse, and then all of a sudden they saw deaths associated with dehydration, metabolic disorders. Basically, over time, these people kept revving up, revving up, revving up. They kept trying to sedate, they kept trying to control, and ultimately, they, had, they often died. The mortality rate. The mortality rate, and you should ask us in a live audience, what do you think the mortality rate would be in this population? And the reality is it was 75%. So three out of four people that started to rev up and didn't have appropriate treatment to try to calm them down, sedate them and treat them and use calming medications died. Now, as you go through the medical literature, uh, there's lots of reports of this. Um, in the 1900s, they call it lethal catatonia, typhotic furors, all kinds of names, but ultimately they're describing the same phenomenon. But in the late, late, mid to late 60s, when mood stabilizers started to come out, the antipsychotic medications like Thorazine, uh, this ad there, you know, restore them to their senses. Uh, as far as things go, instead of using the bucket of water to try to reset them, use medications. And, and the reality was the use of the medications certainly decreased the death rates in that population of mental health uh, types of excited delirium presentations. It went away and, and basically it was, it was a good thing until the 80s uh, and Miami Vice and the drug trades going through there primarily, uh, but it obviously worked its way across the country. And this is the first paper by Wetley and Fishbane discussing the excited delirium syndrome that is more of the, the, the current version that we see more often than not, um, the drug-induced type. Uh, it's been reported with cocaine, 
methamphetamine. Uh, and really, it's, it ends up being local flavor. Uh, most of our cases here in San Diego County, because methamphetamine is, is more prevalent here, uh, tend to be due to that. But we still see it from cocaine or uh, it's been reported with PCP, LSD, bath salts, Flocka, uh, those tend to be more East Coast types of uh, presentations. And I, I have asterisks on there because a lot of times uh, when evaluating a patient in the emergency department or evaluating a patient uh, post-mortem at a, at a medical examiner's office, uh, drug screens are done. And a lot of these drugs don't show up on routine urine drug screens, as many of you probably know. Uh, we'll see cocaine and methamphetamine, sometimes PCB, sometimes not, depending what uh, screen they use. We'll see marijuana and opioids. But LSD, bath salts, flocka, and there's a number, number of other designer drugs that just don't show up. And so the behavior may not have a positive drug screen, but when you start seeing the, the videos of how people present, it's it's typically clear that there's something else going on. A lot of the excited delirium ca cases have uh, very similar events. There's an agitated, psychotic individual state of excited delirium, often with drug use. Um, typically now we think that about 90 to 95% of the cases of excited delirium syndrome that present now are due to drug use, uh, stimulant drug use, like as we discussed, methamphetamine and cocaine leading that pack. Um, about five to 10% might be psychiatric disorders in which patients have not either decided to continue their medications, felt better and stop them. And then there's a revving up process. And when you look at the cases of them occurring, uh, there is that increasing time over almost what this was described by Bell as a, a ramping up period, more paranoid, more anxious, more hiding, more bizarre behavior until somebody gets involved to try to find out what's going on with them. So we still see that, just not as frequently. Uh, oftentimes there's a struggle, whether it's in the emergency department, whether it's with paramedics, whether it's with law enforcement. Uh, a lot of these times the individuals are very violent, a lot of times they are intermittently violent. Uh, they're not always fighting the whole time. That's not always a struggle. As you saw with the guy in the first video, he's acting bizarre and, and, and uh, a little agitated and hyperactive, but wasn't violent at that point. Uh, then he starts running away and there'll be more other videos. So there are quiescent periods and then there are struggles, but oftentimes in order to start treatment, you have to have them in a safe position. In the emergency department, we don't run around with needles and, and try to inject people that aren't in a controlled uh, component of, of, of ability to receive it if they need to. We need to really do use restraints or um, other methods to try to control people. Uh, oftentimes when we try to use verbal de-escalation, it can have some effects, but it doesn't typically stop somebody and allow them us to treat them safely. And then when they look at the autopsies and the ones that end up dying, uh, there is no clear cause of death. Uh, the medical examiners will look at it and they'll see, um, they'll see clear lungs, relatively normal heart, sometimes an enlarged heart due to chronic drug use often in these cases, um, but really no obvious source. It wasn't a big bleed in the head. It wasn't a blood clot to the lung. It wasn't evidence of a heart attack. And oftentimes these get attributed to being uh, positional restraint asphyxia because of the restraint that often was preceding the ability to try to, to maintain them. You know, again, we at the very beginning, I touched on the topic of excited delirium syndrome. Uh, there is question whether it's real, not real. Uh, I think that if you get beyond the name and the title and you look at the, the actual clinical presentation, there's something there. Uh, the DeMaios, uh, he's a medical examiner, wrote a book on the topic. And uh, originally, this, this came out a while back, but when it came out, the thought was that you had to die to have a diagnosis of excited delirium syndrome uh, because all the cases he saw were deaths. He was a medical examiner. And so that was one of the criteria that they felt at that point was probably involved. And in fact, in 2004, the National Association of Medical Examiners, that's the largest group of medical examiners in the country. That's their national association. They recognized uh, that excited delirium syndrome does exist, that people do have this phenomenon where they get revved up, often drug related, and they will have sudden cardiac events at certain positions of the time and will die. 
uh, their position was that it was something they saw they that they were fatal. The American College of Emergency Physicians, one of the groups I belong to, that's our largest body of practicing emergency physicians, uh, followed in suit in 2009 and put out a white paper basically acknowledging the existence of excited delirium syndrome, that it's out there, that there are certain symptoms that you would use to help diagnose the syndrome, and really more importantly, how to try to address it, how to try to uh, save these lives, how to take somebody who is revved up and potentially in a, in a point where they may go into cardiac arrest or not, how to try to address that so we don't lose more individuals. It's recognized by a lot of the law enforcement groups as well. Who doesn't recognize it? The American Psychiatric Association. And that's what the challenge is because they're the ones who put the diagnostic criteria for the DSMs, right? So that's their role. The, and part of it is the you know, cardiologists don't recognize it, neuro, uh, neurosurgeons don't recognize it, certain groups don't recognize it, probably more along the lines because they're not the ones taking care of it. You know, the EMS providers, the medical examiners, the ER docs are. Um, and again, this is not a disorder that tends to go to a clinic or an office to try to get treatment. This is somebody who's found out in the street, uh, half naked or completely naked, sweaty, crazy, and wild. And when I say crazy, I don't mean emotionally crazy, just the behavior. Um, it's sort of in the eye of the beholder. This, you know, a guy is very agitated. This guy's hot, sweaty out in public and agitated. These types of things occur. Medicine does know about the different excitements, right? If you go into the ICD-10 codes put out by the World Health Organization, um, there's lots of codes that describe this. And ICD-10 codes are billing codes. That's what we use to bill for patients' uh, diagnostic uh, criteria when we actually evaluate them. Um, I can bill under any of these and as an emergency physician get paid by an insurance company, I don't need the words excited delirium syndrome to get paid. And so that's part of the reason why there's been no major push to try to recognize it as an, its own diagnosis because there's so many other diagnoses that's sort of descriptive of. But I wanna bring this up because this is often something that you hear in the media or in public about it doesn't exist. And I think the, the, the symptoms, the syndrome, the presentation exists the National Association of Medical Examiners recognize it, emergency physicians recognize it, but it doesn't have its own billing code. So again, I don't think that creates the fact that it doesn't exist, but I just wanted to share that because that's sometimes we, we hear that. And in fact, if you go through the medical literature and, and other publications from the 1800s to 1999, there were over 120 publications describing this population of patients from the very first ones that we're talking about with, uh, with Bell. And then from the last 20 years, there's been over another 150 publications on the topic of excited delirium syndrome. Uh, a few of these that I've been involved in, but there's, the reality is it's out there. It's been published on, it's been evaluated, it's been researched. So I think that from that perspective, it, it, it exists. Uh, again, call it what you like, but I think it's the, the, the population of patients that we're all on the same page with. And again, excited delirium syndrome uh, is, is a very small tip of an iceberg. You know, 13 million public uh, police interactions by Baldwin, use of force 10,000 times, uh, felt to be emotionally disturbed uh, for various reasons. That, that was a, a, an interpretation by the law enforcement. But of those, they actually prospectively were looking at features of excited delirium syndrome. We'll talk about those. And when they felt that they had more than six features, uh, or six or greater features, you probably did have somebody truly in a state of excited delirium syndrome. And this was really about 1.8% of all use of force uh, events. So again, it's, it's not a large number in any agency, but there's a small piece that many will come in contact with. Back in the late 90s, uh, Sam Stratton looked at uh, 216 cases of excited delirium individuals who were restrained in a prone position and put into an ambulance. Um, he, they had a high incidence of underlying cardiac disease and there were 18 sudden deaths in custody versus 196 survivors. Meaning in the backs of the ambulances, they got in there alive and they were transported. 18 of them died, 196 survived that transport. So there's a lot of data out there that sort of reflects an 11% mortality rate in this population. 
reality is it's probably less than that. Um, but if you ever hear the number 11%, it's, it's probably a little bit inflated, but the reality is there is still a significant mortality rate in this population of individuals. So if I you know, had a disease that I told you, say it's 5% mortality, you know, one out of every 20 people are gonna die, that's important. And so that's why this is, a, is an important topic. There's documentation is, uh, that should be done at different levels. And these are some of the uh, criteria that are being felt. And I'll talk about them in a moment. But things that really come up there, the naked or inadequately clothed. You know, there are cases where people are running around naked in 30 degree weather. They're trying to cool themselves off in frozen ponds because they're so hot. Uh, there is the self, the, trying, to, trying to cool themselves off, the profuse sweating. You know, these types of things are things that should raise our attention if you hear about that um, in your involvement with a, with a patient potentially. Uh, excessive strength out of proportion, uh, lack of tiring, we'll talk about that. Again, <clears throat> the idea of defining it, uh, we've done better with it now, but the reality is it's sort of like what uh, Justice Potter Stewart was talking about, you know, pornography. I know it when I see it. Um, I just can't give you a good definition of it. And I think excited delirium is very similar to that. There will be a couple of videos you'll see that there's just something not, that's not quite right. Uh, there's something beyond a little bit of methamphetamine intoxication or cocaine intoxication. So these are the described criteria, um, unresponsive to police presence or other um, presence, constant or near constant physical activity. They are continuing to rev up. They keep being active, mo you know, fighting, struggling. They may be handcuffed. They may be restrained to a gurney, uh, but they're going to keep struggling and struggling uh, with potential quiescent periods. Naked or inappropriately clothed. I'm going to emphasize this because the idea that these people have some sort of internal combustion feeling going on is there. They have, they'll often have paranoid thoughts about dragons and devils and hell and heat and fires, almost like the, the hallucinations that they're having or the, the uh, delusions they're having are associated with heat related uh, issues. And there may be a component because of what's going on internally. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but if you have a, a naked, sweaty, odd behaving person in public, there's a good chance that this person may be suffering the signs and symptoms of, of excited delirium syndrome. Uh, there's been glass attraction. These people often break windows or go into areas where there's bright lights. The guy in West Palm Beach was going out into traffic where the lights are sort of brighter in the, in the cars. Uh, they're often impervious to pain. Uh, they, you know, they will continue to fight and have injuries to themselves, and yet they'll continue to struggle and fight or certain uh, tools that are used to try to uh, distract them don't work. Um, doesn't fatigue despite heavy physical exertion. And this is common where you'll see law enforcement, you'll see firefighters, you'll see hospital workers get exhausted trying to manage one of these patients, and yet they just keep on plugging through and keep you know, working and working, working. They're working hard, they're studying, but they don't seem to slow down. Superhuman strength is something that's described, throwing people around, can't hold them down. Rapid breathing, sweating profusely and hot to the touch. These are other areas that sort of, again, imply some metabolic process going on, some internal combustion. I use the word combustion, but it's almost like an engine revving up. And we'll talk about that in a bit with some of the science behind it. Um, some say it hasn't been studied, and the reality is there have been studies out there. Up in Canada, uh, Chris Hall's group has looked at the different um, features that we just described there, percentages, presence of them. And again, it sort of felt that if you probably have six or more of those symptoms, you can certainly use it to describe a excited delirium syndrome. So there is, there's a lot of training that we're trying to do to help protect and get these patients the treatment they need. Again, it's a medical emergency. Um, you're looking at from the dispatch level, you know, the phone call that comes in from mom, from dad, from somebody down the street, seeing somebody running down the, the, the sidewalk. You know, if we know that they have known uh, psychiatric illnesses, they are potentially at risk. If we know that they were using drugs, particularly stimulant drugs, cocaine, methamphetamine, PCP, there's something potentially adding on to it. 
Have they been called before? Uh, again, this is not universally a lethal issue. In fact, more often than not, the individual will do well and survive if given treatment in a timely manner. Uh, but they may recur. They can. People have had uh, multiple episodes of excited delirium syndrome. So if you've had it before, they could potentially have it again. Again, destructive behavior. And really the idea of the call trainers should be trained to recognize this. That something is quite a higher level. And what we're saying with that is that when you recognize this is a potential excited delirium case, obviously there's going to have to be some ability to get the person into a position to be evaluated by medical personnel, but the medical personnel should be dispatched as well. So trying to work with the collaboration in, the, in field cases of law enforcement and EMS. When you get there on arrival, right, you're looking at it. You've seen a couple of videos thus far, bizarre, irrational behaviors, often constant near constant activity, aggression potentially, often towards inanimate objects, breaking windows, breaking cans, the glass attraction we talked about. And again, I want to bring the, the inappropriate clothes. Now, you know, if you're out in Phoenix or San Diego in the summertime and somebody's hot and sweaty and, and, and uh, has their shirt off, okay, that's, that may not be as telling. But, you know, if you're in Chicago in wintertime, there's somebody running around naked. That's, that's, a, that's a cue there that, that you want to be concerned about. On contact, you know, once you start to actually get there and uh, realize this person's not responding or they're intermittently responding, they, like the guy in the first video, he goes down, he gets back up. He's sort of trying to trying to hold it together, but he's not quite able to do it. Uh, insensitive to, to pain. Um, often, you know, law enforcement uses tools such as tasers or um, restra you know, restraint maneuvers. And if you're using something that may be causing pain and they're not responding to it, you probably don't need to. We train law enforcement on that, that you know, if a distraction uh, strike or a taser use or something else isn't working, then don't keep using it. It's, it, it's probably because they can't feel it and it's not bothering them, it's only gonna cause physical harm that's not necessary. They may be hot to the touch, they may be sweating profusely. These are things that are important to recognize. Struggling. Whether it's in the emergency department, whether it's with firefighters trying to get a patient into control, or whether it's law enforcement, the struggle often involves multiple people. These people are, are strong, they're sweaty, they're hard to get a hold of. Um, there's often the continued struggle against futility. If they're ha handcuffed or they're putting restraints on a gurney, um, as, as Stratton's group talked about there with the EMS, you know, they kept fighting in the back of the ambulance and 11% of them died. And that's probably because there wasn't a good policy for sedation in that population. Um, the uh, smashing of windows and things like that. So this is stuff that you will recognize. Again, these are all cues that this person is having a medical emergency. Uh, they're going to have to be contained at some level so that medications can be delivered and assessments can be done. But the reality is this is the, the, the interaction oftentimes between law enforcement and medicine. And this is one of the areas that we're really trying to, to promote is the idea of recognizing and controlling so that EMS can start sedating and transporting. This is our goal to try to really minimize the death rate to help these individuals have less uh, morbidity and mortality. So early recognition, you know, to get somebody in control and then call EMS and it takes them eight minutes to get there is not doing anybody any good. So if you recognize the idea is to call EMS early, um, but these cases pop up everywhere. I do want to touch a little bit on the science. Um, sometimes it, it's, I think, brought out in the lay public or in uh, media that, you know, there is no science, it's just a made up disorder and things like that. And there is data behind it. Um, the idea really is there's a component where methamphetamine tends to uh, add more dopamine to receptors and cocaine blocks it from being reuptake. So there is a, a combination feeling. There has been research looking at the dopamine transporters. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but I want you to be aware that there is more than just um, me telling you it exists. There's data and science out there that it has looked at it. Um, you know, co cocaine users get uh, increased dopamine uh, uptake. Excited delirium does not. And I'll explain that in a moment. But the reality is 
looking at things binding to the dopamine transporter. Again, it's in our brains, in our nerves, there are, we call synapses, right? One nerve attacking, attaching to another nerve and there's this gap as they send off neurotransmitters across from one nerve to the other. And that's how we, our bodies function, you know, almost like at the speed of light, right? These things are just going all the time. Um, when nerve one is kicking over some dopamine to nerve two, that dopamine's in the synapse, and it's firing off those two nerves. And then at, over time, very brief time, that dopamine gets re-picked up by the, by the neurotransmitter going through dopamine transports, and it gets into the cell for the next impulse. And this happens you know, instantaneously, but if the dopamine does not make it back in, if it doesn't go through the transporter, then you have this problem. So in normal people, you have these reuptake transporters and the dopamine gets in the system, it goes back into the cell. In people who use chronic recreational cocaine or methamphetamine, uh, particularly cocaine, you'll see the reuptake uh, or the dopamine transporters increase just over time to help sort of protect you because the drugs themselves block them. So you're still getting your dopamine coming back into your system. In excited delirium, there appears to be some downregulation of these actual transporters. Uh, this has been done by Deb Mash's group out of Miami, where they looked at postmortem brains of many different types of individuals. And so when the you get the cocaine or the methamphetamine in there and they're blocking uptake, the dopamine just sort of builds up in that synapse. And dopamine is what creates a lot of this revving up of the engine. That's why I've been sort of referencing there. It's got your, your foot on the gas, right? Your temperatures go up. We'll see if temperatures in 106. Um, there are cases where uh, patients have been in cardiac arrest. They die. The medical examiner comes out two hours later, and they measure a temperature on somebody who's been sitting in 50-degree weather, and their core body temperature is still 104. You know, that's not just from a little drug use. That's not from a little schizophrenia that's out of control. That's some level ramped up. Uh, you'll see the sweating, the fighting, the inability to tire. All this is felt to be the neurotransmitters just keep firing and firing and firing and firing. It is a ramping up process that we need to intervene with. Otherwise, we are likely to see the types of cases that they saw with Bell's mania where they had 75% mortality rates. So again, a medical emergency, we've got to recognize this. There are calming efforts, you know, and, and I'll show you some examples in a moment, but you know, de-escalation, it's not gonna fix this, but there is some utility in it. Uh, having five people yelling at the same person there, we don't know what's going on in their heads right now, right? They are very agitated, they are, uh, under the influence, they are stimulated. Everything is firing off. We talk about their physiology. The same thing is happening with the, the mental uh, status of them as well. So a bunch of voices coming inside, yelling at them is probably not helping. So one person trying to calm, you can sometimes gain some leverage in trying to help get them into control a little easier. Not always, but it's always worth trying. I'm a fan of trying to do that, trying to sort of work it, but there are situations where that won't work. Uh, ultimately, what we want to do is minimize the struggle. So if you think about this, these are people who have some sort of drugs in general in their system, methamphetamines revving things up, the motor is revving things up. Methamphetamine causes acidosis. It causes your blood to be more acidic. It lowers your pH. Not good for your heart. The agitation uh, and ex excitation, the, the fighting creates lactic acid. You watch MMA fighters or boxers, that activity of moving their arms and legs and kicking creates a lot of acidosis. That burn you feel when you're using your arm screwing in a screwdriver and it starts to burn or your activity on a bike and your thighs start to burn, that's lactic acid building up. That makes our blood more acidic. So you've got drugs in your system making the blood acidic. You've got this fighting and agitation. Plus, you've got the central nervous system revving things up. So these people come in very low pHs, very high acidity levels. And the longer we struggle with them, the longer we fight with them, the longer it takes us to get them restrained and sedated, the more at risk they are. So again, back to quickly control and do it efficiently is our goal. And then afterwards, we really want to be careful and watch them. If the ambulance is not there yet, we want to be looking at them 
in the emergency department, when I get these people in there, we start to say that I want to be watching them carefully. So we do want to watch because there's still a chance they're going to go into cardiac arrest and we want to try to give them the best chance possible. So again, techniques, verbal de-escalation, there is, there is a component there. I don't expect it to work. Uh, I try because I'm sometimes pleasantly surprised that it does have an impact, but the reality is it's, it's a tough one to use. There's lots of police techniques that I'm not going to go into here to try to get somebody actually restrained. But the next piece we're going to do to treat them is sedation. We don't have dark guns. We don't have tranquilizer guns. This isn't Wild Kingdom. So we do have to get the person in a position where they're not going to harm themselves or harm the providers trying to help them. That often requires some level of restraint. Then sedation can be started. So again, overall, our goal is quick control. Try to reduce that fighting, that struggling, that metabolic acidosis production from lactic acid. We want to, you know, get them swaddled. You know, when you once you get them restrained, they can fight against the restraints. They can pull their hands back and forth. They can move their legs back and forth, but they're not using the large muscle groups. It's the biceps, the thighs, those large muscle groups contracting and fighting that create the most lactic acid. That's why boxers and wrestlers get so fatigued after a three minute round because they are creating a lot of lactic acid using those large groups and moving around. We're trying to reduce that. So even if they're struggling against resistance, they don't create as much lactic acid. They don't consume as much oxygen as they do when they are truly struggling and fighting. And then sedation, calming medications. We want to reduce that metabolic process that's going on in their brain or stop the revving engine. We want to, we want to intervene before the engine blows. We want to take the foot off the brake as we're uh, off the gas, what we're trying to do. So sedation is important. And then obviously medical evaluation, looking for other things going on with the individuals. Again, sort of summary, most of excited delirium patients are going to live. Some will die uh, despite optimal care, optimal uh, efforts to try to get them medical care quickly. Some are still going to die. And that's because you can't stop some of that central revving up process, you know, re re reversing that, you know, temperature of 105 and the heart rate of 170 and the blood pressure off the mark is not an immediate thing. It's not always successful. Uh, we want vigilance. We want documentation. We want people to recognize this as a medical emergency and follow it such. And then we want aggressive treatment. We want uh, law enforcement to be collaborative with EMS. And I think we've, over the last 10 years, it has been much more uh, collaborative that way. This type of person should not be put in the back of a police car when they're that crazy and well. They need early sedation and evaluation. I've talked about the heat a few times. Um, this is important because as you look at people, they get hot, they get sweaty, the guy in the jail cell. This is a sign that this person is just completely revved up. Now, again, you know, it's 110 outside, they may be sweating for other reasons, but when it's a controlled environment, you have to question that. And in fact, uh, Deb Mash uh, coined the, the concept that her, hy hyperthermia, an elevated temperature, is the harbinger of death. Um, there'll be a lot of agitated patients, but when you start seeing these high temperatures, they're the ones that tend to more often go into cardiac arrest. And it's probably because that's a sign that their whole braking mechanism is, is, is stopped. The engine is revving and revving. So checking core temperatures earlier are important. I've been asked questions about, you know, letting them burn it out of their system, right? It's drug use. Let the drugs calm down and then you know, they'll be better. They've used drugs before. They'll use it again. Those types of comments. And, and my response to that is that, first of all, there's not always the opportunity to do so. Oftentimes people are in situations where you have to intervene. The first video where the guy goes walking into traffic. The officer can't just walk away and let him stand in traffic. There's, there's other, other situations where you just can't walk away. You're going to have to intervene. And that often, even though this doesn't seem violent, it may turn more aggressive and violent when hands are on. The patient may not recognize what's going on. They're delusional. They may think that you are devils or dragons trying to attack them and they respond back. We don't know what's going on in their heads, but we do know that this person is likely having a medical emergency and will need medical treatment. Leaving them run around, there is no data on that because the reality is we know that Bell's group lost 75% of their people. Will the drugs run out of their system? There's no thought that the central braking system's all of a sudden gonna fix itself. So um, the medical community feels this population should not let 
just let you know, let them go, let them run wild, but rather get them in control, get them sedated, stop that lactic acid production, and try to save their lives. Again, from a perspective of lawsuits, right? The biggest thing that causes lawsuits are cardiac arrests. Again, we're not trying, if we save people, that's what we want to do. Sometimes it doesn't, and that's just, that's just unfortunate. But other things we try to train our law enforcement, our, our security at the hospital, our EMS providers, our firefighters is watching weight on the body. You know, neck holds and tasers are always going to be criticized, but often uh, something like the taser can be a way of gaining control very quickly and minimizing lactic acid. Topic for another lecture someday. Um, not monitoring, not watching, not paying attention to the individual, what they're doing. You know, the screaming, yelling, and screaming, yelling, they're moving air, they're doing fine. But when they get quiet, you need to find out what's going on. Are they quiet because they got tired? Not often the case. These people don't tend to tire out. So oftentimes it's, cre it's because they've gone into cardiac arrest. And then obviously, obviously issues we've talked about, we're trying to get early recognition so that we get early treatment. So delays in getting EMS involved is another challenge that often happens. So hopefully over this hour, I've given you the idea that there is a disease out there. Call it what you want. Uh, I call it excited delirium syndrome as do many of my colleagues in the medical examiners and groups. Some people are critical of it, but the reality is there is this disorder out there that is not just drug intoxication. And I'm hopefully got the point across that naked man in public may equal excited delirium. Think about that. So I'm hoping that at this point you can figure out that this is our patient here. Okay, but part two of the quiz is, can you pick off the off-duty ER physician? Can you pick me out in this crowd here, right? And that's me because for a change, I'm not the one having to, to try to wrestle with him, trying to get him sedated, trying to, to, to struggle with him to get him so he does not end up uh, having a negative outcome. So again, I, I hope this gives you a little bit of oversight into the concept of excited delirium, some of the science behind it, some of the concepts behind it. Yeah.